This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. It's a unique piece of history. The first and largest early American water-powered industrial complex in Florida. Abandoned in the 1850s, it was rediscovered more than a century later. Excavated and now preserved for the education and enjoyment of future generations, it's the Arcadia Mill Archaeological Site. And if you happen to find yourself in historic Santa Rosa County, you'll discover it right in your own backyard. There were a number of progressive uh, owners who were trying to industrialize the South to realize that the writing was on the wall. It was a water-powered industrial site. It was the first industrial site in Florida. People don't realize that. It wasn't really until 1964 when a local historian named Warren Weeks uh, was just floating down Pond Creek and saw the dam and realized that it was some sort of historical uh, site. So he did a little research and was able to identify it as Arcadia Mill. So we said there needs to be a place where we tell the story of Arcadia Mill. But there was so much to the story, still so much to the story that's not known that we need to find out. You guys know what an archaeologist is? What do we do? What do we look for? You dig for things. What kind of things? Like, like artifacts. Like, like. Artifacts? We only deal with people. Arcadia Mill is a historic and archaeological site that is owned by the University of West Florida and managed by West Florida Historic Preservation, Inc. Arcadia Mill's history began in 1817 when Juan de la Rua received a land grant from the King of Spain. Uh, the land grant was 800 arpents, which comes out to about 680 acres. Uh, de la Rua became involved with Pensacola politics and business and did not develop the land. In 1828, he sold uh, his land to Joseph Forsyth. Before constructing his dam and sawmill, Forsyth, however, went into a different line of work. In a part of Florida where rocks are rare, Forsyth established a quarry with which to supply the wharves of Pensacola with ironstone. Right now we're walking up to one of the most amazing natural resources that Arcadia has to offer. Uh, this is a larger portion of the ironstone outcropping that we have here at Arcadia. A lot of people are surprised when we say that we have natural stone because that's uncommon for Florida. Uh, this whole area that we're standing in was an ironstone outcropping that they quarried out in order to gain capital. Um, they sold it to areas like the Pensacola Naval Yard, places like that. The Municipal Wharf used ironstone from Arcadia um, as a construction material, but they also used it here, which is very fascinating. Um, when we walk around the site, you'll see more examples of ironstone where it's actually been cut and almost squared off, and it's used as retaining walls, as foundations. We just recently discovered through archaeology that they were using ironstone piers for their residential structures. Uh, so this was an incredibly useful resource to them. Um, for those of you that don't know what ironstone is, it's a um, type of natural stone that's very high in iron oxide. It kind of gives it that purplish red color and it also is somewhat magnetized to where um, sometimes in archaeology we use metal detectors to try and identify um, iron features and the ironstone will actually set off um, a metal detector to some degree. Um, it's very neat, aside from just the outcropping still being here, you can also see drill marks where the African American slaves were actually drilling and quarrying out this ironstone. So that's something that we always like to show people. That's kind of a cultural construction that you can still see today in this uh, really dense uh, natural rock. Um, also, it's all over the site, even aside from this quarried area. As you can see, there's a piece right here on the ground um, I would pick it up, but that is a practice that we uh, try to deter people from, is picking up anything that you find on an archaeological or historical site. Uh, if you see things like this, even though it's fascinating, you always want to leave it where it is and let an archaeologist or a professional uh, handle it. In 1830, Joseph Forsyth partnered with uh, Andrew and Ezekiel Simpson, whose father owned Woodbine Sawmill. Uh, the Simpson brothers brought in the needed capital and industrial know-how to build the sawmill here at Arcadia. The first sawmill was built on the banks of Pond Creek 
Uh, they built a 15-foot dam that stretched about a half mile long. The surrounding forests provided a more than ample supply of lumber for Arcadia's mill. Back then, trees reached 70 feet high to the first limb. Now, in the heyday of the Florida Panhandle's timber boom, giant trees were commonplace. Those were what we called virgin timber. That means that nobody had ever come and cut anything down in the forest. Um, it was always natural. If there was a fire, it was started by lightning or something else that was natural, not humans, not from humans. And if there was a tree that died, it was because it, grow, it grew so much that it died of old age. You know how big the trees were when we were cutting them down? 120 feet. You see how, you see how big the, how around that tree is? Do you guys think you could put your arms around it and hug it and connect? Do you think you could touch your fingers? It was a forerunner of what became Baghdad, the uh, timber era of the late 19th century. And uh, so the, the Forsyth Simpson Mill here really is a very key landmark to understanding Florida history. In uh, 1840, uh, Arcadia was a fantastically successful industrial uh, enterprise, turning out uh, hundreds of thousands of board feet per year, but they had a problem getting their product to market because we're three miles from the Blackwater River, the shipping lanes or the interstates of their day. Which eventually caused transportation issues. Um, that three miles doesn't seem like much, but it was actually a long way to go while they were transporting products. Um, they used a lot of flat bottom boats, um, but Pond Creek is a pretty narrow channel, which made it very difficult to use water to transport these products. So in 1838, uh, the firm of Forsyth and Simpson, along with Timothy Twitchell, decided to charter the Arcadia and Blackwater Railway. The Arcadia Railroad was a three mile long mule drawn railway. It had wooden rails um, with iron ties. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't that successful and it didn't really turn out to be as efficient as they had hoped. Uh, the mule labor wasn't very efficient and the railroad itself wasn't exactly stable like they thought it would be. So the railroad didn't run very long, though they were successful and they got it to operate. This is an example of a historic railroad cart like the one that we would have had at Arcadia that was drawn with mule labor. We actually have it placed here by our Discovery Pavilion uh, because the area of the railroad bed is actually somewhat hard to see. Uh, we can identify it, but it's actually starting to erode, so in order to protect it, we decided to interpret part of the railroad here by our Discovery Pavilion where it fits in with the other uh, replicas. Arcadia's tour guides are adept at tailoring their tours to the ages and interests of their visitors, such as these from the Pensacola Learning Cooperative. Younger students might learn about flora and fauna, while the older ones are told how people in the 19th century put water to work. Can you hold them at the sign and let Mike go by? Just have them group onto, the, onto your left side, my right. What was following us all the way here? Water. Water. So what do you guys think we were powered off of? Water. Water. How in the world can we be powered off water? Well, we had something special. You see this right here? That is our water wheel. We're going to see that. We're going to see a smaller version of that. And if you've seen one, you, you understand that it goes around and around and around and around, right? Because the water keeps on hitting it. Well, we would take that and then we would connect it to other things. Right here, you see this? Why do you think we have walls built right here? What's coming off so that water wheel? Won't come out. So the water won't come out. Because what would happen if the water came out? It would be flooded. It would yeah. flood. It would go everywhere. And what's water doing? We need water, Why? right? Why? It had a wheel. Energy. Energy, very nice. That was a nice term. All right, we use it for energy. Do you guys know where this went? Has anybody been canoeing or down to Blackwater? Well, Blackwater is that it's really, really dark, but it's also really, really big and it connects to the ocean. So this went all the way down to Blackwater so that we could take our stuff and we could ship it to China. We could ship it to England and Europe. This is the Discovery Pavilion here at Arcadia Mill. 
In this area, we have some working replicas of some of the technology they used in the sawmills. So we're gonna come over here and take a look at some of the working replicas that we have here on the site. Our first piece is our dipping kettle. Uh, workers and employees would have built a fire underneath the kettle, and you can see the chimney in the back. They would have used this large bowl to heat and boil pig fat. They would have then used that pig fat on the machine parts to lubricate the parts and keep everything operating smoothly. This is our deadheader, and this was used to go out into the water to pull up logs that had actually sunk. Men would be in both sides of the deadheader, and one lucky guy would have been assigned to swim down to the bottom of the mill pond, wrap this chain around a piece of wood that had sunk, and then the men on the top would turn until the chain pulled the piece of log up above the water. They would then take the piece of wood to the edge of the water where it would then be transported to the mill. Here at Arcadia Mill, we utilize water power. This is, a, is an, this is an example of a water wheel. This is an overshot water wheel. As you can see, the water is coming over the top of the wheel, falling down and causing the wheel to turn. The power from the water wheel is then being transferred to the saw. Here at Arcadia Mill, we had what's called a vertical sash saw. And this is an example of one here. As you can see, the, the wood is coming through. It's being cut on two sides. Uh, after the wood would be processed, the men would take the piece of wood that had been cut, they would put it back onto the other side of the blades, turn it, and bring it through a second time, and they would create quartered wood. As you can see, all four sides of this piece of wood have been cut off. Uh, our mill produced quartered wood that would be used for posts, much like this one that we see right here. Here at Arcadia, we are lucky enough to have a replica log cart uh, this cart is a representative of what they would have used while the mills were in operation. As you can see, uh, we have some large wheels on this log cart, and we actually have iron wheel rings. And the reason they put these wheel rings on is the terrain is actually very rough, and these wooden wheels would have broken uh, quite often. And as you can see, these wooden wheels are, are in segments, so that if a segment of the wheel were to break, they could easily replace it. This ox cart is set up for two oxen, which is actually a small team of oxen. Out here we had oxen, we had teams of up to 12 oxen, which would stretch about 15 to 20 feet in that direction. Something, something else interesting that they did was they would put the lighter oxen at the front of the ox cart so that the drivers would use the light from the moon to see where the lead oxen were actually steering the cart. Visiting the Arcadia Mill site really engages the imagination. You can't help but think about the incredible effort of manual labor that it took to construct a 15-foot tall dam or to dig the flumes and watercourses that transported timber and powered the mill's machinery. Archaeologists and historians help you to see all this in your mind's eye with strategically placed signs and excavations. We have an elevated boardwalk as well as hiking trails to the north and we have uh, various interpretive panels throughout the site that tell the story of Arcadia Mill. All right, what we've been walking on is actually a dam, and it was in its prime 15 feet tall and about eight feet wide. And you can see how tall it was if you just look behind you. This whole pit, that was Mill Pond. This whole thing was Mill Pond right there. Right now we're standing next to the Mill Race, which is one of the very interesting uh, man-made features that we have here at Arcadia. This would have been board lined and it was um, hand dug in order to divert water from Pond Creek, the main source of water, down to a secondary milling operation. Uh, mill races were also used in some circumstances to divert water away from certain locations as well. Hey, do you guys remember that rock I told you about? Yeah. Do you remember what it's called? It's kind of a weird name. It's iron stone, like what castles are made out of. Stone, right? So, iron stone and that's what this is made out of. We cut some out just for ourselves and we built our wall out of it. You never know what kind of critters you might encounter along Arcadia's boardwalk and nature trails. We ran into reptiles. One was a little on the slow side, but apparently was very determined to make its way across the remains of the mill race. Another, though, was on the slithery side, so it seemed prudent to keep a respectful distance. See, 
see, this is what the sawmill actually looked like. Um, you see how it's open? Anybody have any guesses as to why that might be? Yes, the wind could carry out all the sawdust. And also there was no air conditioning in the 1830s, so uh, it would get kind of hot if they were in a stuffy building like that. This was kind of a, a gnarly kind of business. The people who got their limbs chopped off by working up, up at the top level would actually be able to work down at the bottom level by greasing all the gears. All right, we're gonna stop up here and we call this our future telling tree. It tells us one thing about the future. This tree right here, it tells us when it's gonna rain. You know how it does that? Well, first off, it's a silver bay magnolia. I told you this one can tell us when it's gonna rain. That's because it doesn't get enough water through its roots. So what it does is it tries to get a little, the tiniest bit of water in its leaves. It turns upside down to catch the water or it curls up like this. With the advent of steam power, Arcadia's lumber mills moved to nearby Baghdad on the Blackwater River. The steam engine was successfully adapted to the lumber industry in Arcadia uh, with Forsyth and Simpson being rather progressive for this area, purchased one and they moved their whole lumber operation to Baghdad. The names of Forsyth and Simpson are found on the street signs of the town they helped to establish. The fortunes of Baghdad and Arcadia are intertwined. With its handsome, historic homes built of sturdy timber framed by moss-draped oaks, Baghdad flourished as Arcadia declined. Baghdad was a massive industrial center that stretched across the present day location of the Baghdad mill site. When the industrial industry shifted from Arcadia to Baghdad, of course, the, uh, the mill management and the workers moved to Baghdad and along Forsyth Street, which is the main drag going through, through Baghdad, there are a number of spectacular houses, including the Thompson House, uh, which is, is marked by a bronze marker, but there are other two-story, beautiful Florida vernacular houses that represent the owners and the managers of the Baghdad business. In addition, in some of the side streets are some of the workers' houses, which are shotguns and, and more modest houses, but uh, the, the remnants in architecture of the, the glory days of Baghdad Mill are still there. It's, it has now been filled and they're developing a park out there and so forth, but if you go outside of the walls near the river and near Pond Creek, uh, you can still see parts of the gang saw and some of the other features from old Baghdad from the 1840s and 50s. Baghdad is a pleasant little village that is preserved as a village, a historic village. It tells a lot about early Florida. Now even though Baghdad provided a better location for their sawmills, Forsyth and Simpson did not forsake Arcadia. In 1845, they returned with a new and radical business plan. In an era when most southern agricultural products were shipped north for processing, they built a cotton textile mill. The Arcadia Textile Mill was a two and a half story brick structure. Uh, the labor force in that textile mill uh, was made up of 40 African American slaves. Now this is part and parcel to a larger issue that had to do with the years leading up to the Civil War in that the South was seen somewhat as a colony providing raw materials to the Northeast and to the Midwest. And so they established a, a textile mill here in an attempt to industrialize and kind of break the chain of, of being strictly suppliers of raw materials. What's this right here? Remember we made our cotton, that fuzzy stuff, into a thread and then we would sew it, or I use a, a different term, we would loom it into a fabric. You see all these lines? You, think, you guys think that's complicated or you think it's really simple to do something like that? complicated. It's probably really complicated. Now an interesting thing about it in a particularly southern way was that, that the southern industrialists hired trained slaves to run their mills. The textile mill operated for 10 years and in that time the labor force grew to over 100 slaves. And this was a controversy because many people felt like slaves were only capable for being house servants and 
uh, being field hands, and there were others who obviously knew better, and Forsyth and Simpson hired highly skilled slaves. They, they, they purchased them from Virginia and brought them here. It caused a great controversy here in the newspapers locally about whether or not that was that was appropriate, and of course, the, the very notion that, that uh, African Americans could actually manage and maintain complex machinery kicked the supports out from under the concept that, that slaves were not capable of anymore. So uh, from a national perspective, this is an important site in demonstrating that that was not true, that people are people and that they are capable of doing those kinds of things. And uh, although the, the textile mill was not a smashing success, it had nothing to do with the, the setup that they had or the workers that they had. It simply was that there was not a market. They never went broke, but they kind of stayed even. Now in 1855, Forsyth, who was the guiding light behind this, passed away. And within three months, the other members of his board shut Arcadia down. And so that's the end of the story here for Arcadia. And the, the, um, the industrial center completely shifted to Baghdad where the Baghdad mill industries continued into the 20th century when the Great Depression uh, killed it off. And they were tremendously successful there, but there's a direct um, connection between Arcadia as the precursor to, to Baghdad. The same owners, the same equipment was taken there, and the same in, in results and, and fantastic profits that they were, they were starting to realize here continued at Baghdad. Uh, during the 1860s, there were multiple troop uh, movements through the property, both Union and Confederate. Uh, during the Civil War, the Arcadia Mill Dam wall was blown up. Uh, we do not have any evidence as to which side was responsible for the explosion, though uh, in 1863, as the Confederates were retreating this area, they did destroy and pillage most of Milton and Baghdad. In 1964, local historian Warren Weeks rediscovered the Arcadia Mill site. In subsequent decades, the Santa Rosa Historical Society, the University of West Florida, and many volunteers worked together to document the archaeological remains and interpret the site. It was actually being threatened by development. As you see, we have a modern uh, neighborhood that's kind of encroached around us. Uh, so it was very important to try and save the property. In the late 80s, 86, 87, when the old Arcadia subdivision began to be developed, the, the entire area was platted for subdivisions. And some of the local individuals with the Santa Rosa Historical Society, Mr. Weeks and Brian Rucker, realized that Arcadia itself could be threatened by the development. And a, and a series of grants were provided to purchase those lots and those areas so that Arcadia would be preserved. And we've had a wonderful relationship with the, uh, with the community uh, through the years. When a ribbon cutting ceremony was held to celebrate renovations to the visitor center and museum, it served as a reunion of sorts for the scholars and volunteers who brought the mill site back to life. It's a beautiful day to be here to celebrate the work that we have accomplished at Arcadia Mill over the course of the last 18 months or so. There was so much information that we could add to it that what we decided to do was to take what in essence was originally built as sort of a temporary building to uh, reinforce that building and turn it into an education and interpretive center. And that is what we've done over the course of the last year and we want to show that to you because it's a major accomplishment. Yeah, be good, okay? Well done. Here we go. Bye! Hey. All right. All right, come on in. <laughs> You'll see when you go inside this wonderful renovation that makes this one of the true great uh, cultural and educational resources. This is where industry, hard industry, began in the state of what became the state of Florida, right here on these grounds and that wonderful trail there. This mill, this idea, this vision that these early pioneers had for Florida. It's all started here. Now it's been preserved as a laboratory for, uh, for the future. Recently, we have um, really developed it into a site open to the public. We offer education. We do a lot of field trips. 
We also host archaeological digs through UWF. So the last three summers, we've had students out here digging in the uplands, trying to learn more about the population and the slaves and the Anglo workers and the people that really made this mill thrive. So that's kind of where we are right now, trying to investigate areas that we don't know as much about. Um, and that kind of brings us to present day. We just renovated, we have a wonderful new facility and we're just looking forward to continuing in an upward direction. But right here in this rural part of Santa Rosa County, you got, you got a site that says this were, is where industry began in Florida. And that's, now it's preserved. The Arcadia Mill Archaeological Site is located just off U.S. Highway 90 between Pace and Milton in the northwestern Florida Panhandle. From Highway 90, turn north on Anna Simpson Road and follow the signs to Arcadia Mill. We hope you've enjoyed this look at one of Florida's archaeological and natural treasures. We'll see you again next time right in your own backyard.